You are now listening to The Sound of Sanity. This sound will continue for the duration of the program. Greetings! I am Nathan, and well, I am welcoming you to Sound of Sanity. Oh boy, I feel like I already stumbled over that intro. I'm not happy with it at all, but that's okay, folks. We're marching forward, onward and upward, onward, Christian soldiers. I once read a article about Groucho Marx, where Groucho Marx was an old man who was barely capable of talking, but he would mumble little Groucho Marxy things, and so they served him some omelets, and they they heard him quietly singing to himself. Omelette Christian soldier. Because <laughs> his brain was just, even in its dotage, it worked like that. And so now anytime anyone serves me omelets or mentions omelets, so all the various omelette-related life experience that I've had, omelette Christian soldiers goes through my head. And sometimes I sing Fantastic. it. Fantastic. And sometimes people enjoy it. So I have Groucho Marx to thank for that, as I have him to thank for so many things. My personal hero and inspiration, Groucho Marx. I know some of you like John Calvin, Thomas Hobbes, <laughs> Calvin and Hobbes. I like Groucho Marx. And I am Nathan. I'm your humble and obedient host. Both of those things in great degree. And I'll tell you who has a degree in greatness. Sa- greatness. <laughs> it's, it's Benjamin J. Solzer. He's the preacher. It's a very small degree of greatness. A small degree of greatness. I'll tell you who has a small degree of greatness. <laughs> More like a great degree of smallness. <laughs> <laughs> and she has been. Wait a minute. One oh, of the biggest crud. small men. He's very BJ right there. <laughs> well, he is Ben Solzer. Oh. <laughs> no. He is the whatever he is. Hi, Ben. Hi, yeah. Hi Nathan. Hey, hey. You want to introduce someone who, what is he, what degree does he have? <laughs> I couldn't speak to that. A stud even. degree. <laughs> Did you say a stud degree? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> but I wish I hadn't. <laughs> it's Pastor Jacob Mensel, the pastor who's a master of sanity. Yeah. Hi, Jake. The stud that holds the wall <laughs> that is this podcast together. Yeah. Mm. He dishes out degrees. He dishes. Second and Third degree burns. <laughs> yeah. Booyah. <laughs> He's an arsonist. He's an arsonist. <laughs> that was a good choice. <laughs> well, folks, we are... Nope. I didn't realize this Song was one of ones that would repeat if I didn't... That some one of them, should not be on repeat. Some of them... I, I set all this up. Some of them are meant to repeat if I don't turn them off. Some of them are just one shots. Anyway, folks, today we are taking a, a, a look back at, a, at an episode of our own from 2000, December 2019. We're not going to rehash the content of said episode, but we are going to discuss a certain interesting fact about said episode. And this episode, maybe I'll tell you the interesting fact, and then you can wonder for a moment what the episode is, and then I can tell you. So the interesting fact is that, what is the interesting fact? Is it that This the, episode is far and away... One of, if not our most downloaded episode of all time. It's hard to go back and trace all the stats because we twist, twist. We, we twisted we, servers we a couple times. We switched services, ser- servers multiple times, and so when you do that, you lose your statistics unless you have an external third party, which we do now. Which we do now, but we didn't for the whole of the show. And so I was just going back and looking and trying to reconstruct. How close are we to a million downloads across Warhorn Podcast? It turns out we're actually really close. I think we probably have already passed it, but it's hard to really kind of quantify that and back that up st- statistically. I think I can definitely back up and verify 900,000. I mean, me and Ben's classic episode of Sanity at the Movies, Ramble in the Bronx, that was close to a million downloads itself, I think, right? It's the least downloaded episode <sighs> Um, Unfair. Maybe. (laughs) Well, I will say it's the least downloaded episode of anything from the world we made out of our minds. Then comes what? (laughs) Monumental Sound of Sanity, Sanity at the Movies, and maybe Behind the Lions, but I'm not sure about that one. Between the lions. Between the lions, yeah. <laughs> Behind them, between them. <laughs> Around in the lions. In their mouths. Who knows? Who cares? But yeah, 
there may be an episode of Chip and Lance that is downloaded less frequently. I got it. I mean, Chip, yeah, Chip and Lance just hasn't been entered into that tracking service yet. But Ramble in the Bronx, a great episode, actually, where me and Ben talk about martial arts cinema and Hong Kong cinema. And it's pretty cool. It's really interesting. I recommend that you go listen to it. I guess maybe the fact that it was called Ramble in the Bronx. Did it zero favors did it, and maybe negative favors? Yeah, whatever. What's the opposite of a favor? <laughs> There's it caused active harm. I think. Yeah, it <laughs> caused active. This is episode is a rambling episode about something that I don't know what the reference is. I don't know. Folks, you try and name a spoof. Like, make an episode that's a spoof of a famous martial arts title. First, you have to think of a famous martial arts title, and then there has to be a spoof in there. And I guess we should have done Crouching Something. We should have done Podcast of Fury or something. Yeah, I mean, we'd be looking at, we'd be well over that million dollar. Pod Fist of Or you could have just said something about martial arts films <laughs> oh, Jake. Jake. in the title. Uh, uh, let, what a card. Let people know what you're talking about. <laughs> Old Jake always wants our titles to actually tell people what the episodes are about. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, our most popular episode... It, this one does tell people what it's about. Right, because this episode is simply called... Should I reveal it? Yeah, yeah. This episode is simply called Joel Osteen. And it is an episode about Joel Osteen. And we go through his history and we talk about, I mean, we try to answer kind of the same question I want to answer today, which is like, why Joel Osteen? Why does this guy have cachet? Why does he have power? He's such an obvious wolf in so many ways. So why do people listen to Joel Osteen? But apparently he is, well, I don't know. I don't know. The, 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 it made me feel a little, not, not hugely insane i'm glad people are listening to our episodes i'm glad they found something helpful in that joel osteen episode i'm glad that was meeting some kind of felt need but i I did i was like why that one why that one so that is actually the question that i want to answer today what are your gentleman's theories as to why or what are yes what are your gentleman's Mm -hmm. theories what why does that sound wrong you gentleman's theories you said you said your gentleman's theories your gentleman's theories well, I don't want well, any of your ungentleman oh, right. theories. Never mind. I only want your gentleman theories. You got me. What is you, a gentleman's <laughs> theory, upon why <laughs> Joel Osteen is such a popular episode? You know what I think is actually our most popular all time is jo- Jordan Peterson. But we I, just don't oh, have yeah. the numbers to back that up. I, I suspect you're right. But I just went back, and despite the fact that we switched services and and things... That Jordan Peterson episode, and we switched services in 2019, I think. Let me just, yeah, it mid-2019, we switched services. So def- despite the fact that there are two years of missing data for Jordan Peterson, it would be one of our most popular episodes if, like, its total downloads compare to just about anything that we've done. Right, and that's missing. Tons, and that's missing tons of data. two two years of data, including the hot off the presses data. Yeah, I mean, I would say if people are gonna talk to me about something, I, the, I've never had them talk to me about the Joel Osteen episode, but I've certainly had people like if I meet somebody and they're a fan of the podcasts and they want to tell me something that they're they were excited by. It'll be World to Be Made season one. It'll be the Jordan Peterson episode of Sound of Sanity. A certain kind of person. It'll be the Ville. Uh, those are the things that tend to get brought up but yeah so i but in terms of what we actually have transistor data for since we have so since 2019 since 2019 our most downloaded episode is joel osteen right period Hmm. without question right well that ushers us into the part of the show where we talk about why that is why joel osteen why, Joe Osteen? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, Friends, it's very simple, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did people just want to hear us beat up on somebody that they hate? Is it, what, is it a little bit more complicated than that? Did people really feel tension about this guy? What? What are your guys' theories? Ooh, ooh. Yeah, Ben? Well, I, I think it's the same reason that Satan is the most popular character in Paradise Lost. This is interesting. Like, who is this wolf? Who is this guy? He's weird. I want to know more about him. What makes him tick? I, I think that's a good theory. I think that's a pretty good theory. I think Joel Osteen is about as clo- <laughs> close to Satan as, <laughs> as you can get. 
I mean, in terms of someone who is just transparently right. bad, who does not pretend to be good. And of course, Joel Osteen is famous for pretending to be good. But for whatever reason, I've been down this Charlie Manson rabbit hole recently with a book that I think I mentioned on this podcast that I read about the Manson family and stuff like that. The thing people always say about serial killers is, you know, they always, there's the cliche of you see a photograph and there's nothing in the eyes. The They're smiling, uh -huh. but the eyes are vacant. There's nothing there. No one's home, man. You always hear people say that. Joel Osteen is the definition of that. He's always got this giant smile on his face. And then you pull up the like the, the most famous picture, the one from your best life now, mm -hmm. and you just like you just cover the the smile, and you just look at his eyes, and he's he's got the eyes of one of those guys. That his eyes look angry, they look empty. There, there's no part of that big wolfish grin that's that's reaching those eyes. And I'm not mm. I'm not being hyperbolic. I, I I I'm I'm just trying to describe accurately the phenomenon that is. <laughs> Joel Osteen. He is transparently a snake oil salesman. I mean, I think the if I'm remembering, it's been a while since we did that episode, but I think the big point we made there was that he's the whole point of Joel of Joel Osteen, the whole way that his ministry works is that he's transparently bad. Because when you're transparently bad, when you're transparently a snake oil salesman, you actually weed out all the smart people. You actually keep all the smart people yeah. from it's it's what it, it's it, it's the Nigerian prince scam. Exactly right. It's designed to get rid of all the smart people so that only the dumbest people possible. What you don't want to do is waste a lot of time on a false no, positive or a we, false lead. But then we then we talked about too. I mean, the number of highly successful people, doctors, lawyers, that seem to, or at least upper middle class or. Upper, upper, no, because we, I mean, we knew the CEO of a big company that was at his church for a while. Mm -hmm. I think some of it we talked about, I mean, it's been years since we've done it and we didn't go back and re rehash it, but some of it is just like successful people are attracted to the appearance of success right? as well. I think that's got to be part of it too. But What's your theory, Jake? It's pretty simple, but I don't know. It might deflate the whole podcast. Are you just going to say people like easy targets? No. No, I, I think that it comes up in search results when people want to find Joel Osteen and they click on it. Yeah, that's probably true. And so when you actually, I think the same is true of Jordan Peterson. Mm -hmm. So when you search mm -hmm. in Apple Podcasts for Joel Osteen, it brings up a bunch of podcast episodes by Joel Osteen and it brings up several shows. And the shows it brings up are the Joel Osteen Daily Podcast, the Joel Osteen Podcast, Daily Inspiration with Steve Harvey, The Miracle Channel, Best Motivational Speeches, Seven Good Minutes, Oprah, Super Soul, The Steve Harvey Morning Show, It's All Over, The the Sela Project, Christian Quotes, The Ed Milet Show, The School of Greatness with Lewis, Ho ha with Lewis Howes, The Sound of Sanity, Cultish, The Money Sucks Podcast, What a Creep, The, uh, the Friendly Ath Atheist Podcast, Fair and Scott Podcast, and Attitudes all show up just sort of like very quickly, boom, there we are Yep. when you search. Huh. And so then I think people <laughs> find an episode called Joel Osteen, I, a I podcast think that's, called The Sound of Sanity, and they click on it thinking... Like that we interviewed him? You think it's like pro Joel yeah, Osteen people? Yeah, I think people? they think we interviewed him. I think they are interested in learning more about him one way or another. So they just sort of like, I wonder if there's a podcast where Joel's interviewed or that talks about him. And so they scroll around and they find us and they click on our episode and either continue listening or not. Hmm. Hmm. That's my grand theory. Interesting. I think the theory. I, I don't know that that actually ruins my premise though, because people are still searching for Joel Osteen. I don't think you can account for it by just saying it's Joel Osteen fans. Like yeah. they can just listen to Joel Osteen's podcast. Like you don't have to go eight podcasts down the podcast rabbit hole to get some random episode that's pretty obviously going to be an examination or an analysis or an expose or, or something like that. So yeah, we have some episodes that are titled better than others, but I still think there's, there's an inherent fascination with this guy. Yeah. I think one way or another, either people are searching for Osteen because they 
care and they want to hear something he has to say or they want to hear interviews with him or they sense something's wrong with him or they know something's wrong with him. They want to figure something out about him. In any case, they're finding our podcast about Joel Osteen for a reason. And it's because he's interesting to them one way or another, either positively or negatively. So people are, I scrolled through the reviews. I don't see any reviews referencing that episode saying, oh, you jerks, you Joel Osteen haters. So Mm -hmm. I I don't know that people are finding, I mean, we do have a fair number of one star reviews and. And a lot of times when people leave, leave a review on a podcast, they will, it will not be a review of the podcast, but just a, an episode. The thing you said about such and such was stupid. One star. Yeah, that's the that's consistently been our experience. If we get a negative review, it's somebody who stumbled onto the podcast, listened to one episode, and didn't like what we had what we had to say about it. And so, it's very possible that any number of those sort of lower star things are people stumbling on looking for positive things about Joel Osteen. That reinforces the point. It's also possible that we have any number of people that have stumbled on looking for somebody actually dealing with or taking apart Osteen and they found us. And I don't know, maybe that's you, listener. Maybe you found us talking about Osteen and decided, hey, these guys are kind of cool and interesting and they helped me figure out what I didn't like about Osteen. And now I've stuck with them over a couple of years. And if that's you, let us know. We'd like to, we'd mm-hmm. like to know. Yeah. I, I guess that still leaves the question in my mind of, is it, is, I'm like, we didn't do an episode about Joel Osteen for years. We talked about it, but we didn't do it because it was just like, well, this guy's obviously bad. Like, like who cares? Like what, what is there to say? Like, yeah. But then we just kept being sort of confronted with the reality that he's m- massive and always atop the charts of any Christian pod, excuse me, Christian podcast charts or whatever like that. He's just at the top. People listen and care about what he has to say. And then I, we came to that we did that episode before we came to Evansville, but then we came here and he may be one of the most beat up persons from the pulpit that we have. And and in this context, I don't feel so much that it's punching down. Like um, there's actually people that are attracted to that and want to watch it. There's and... enough people that are attracted to that sort of thing that he's a good stand in and placeholder for a whole lot of other things. Yeah. And so there's actual value in throwing a blow his way. Mm -hmm. And it still feels sort of like punching up. It feels like there is an edge to it, actually. Right. Where when you've been in a a church that has, you know, a 30-year history and culture of we would never, ever be tempted by Joel Osteen. And people coming out into our church are very quickly disabused of anything like that. When you go into a church planning context, you just open up to much more broad mainstream influences impacting people and and have to build up a culture that can kind of counteract and withstand them. Right. It's it's worth dealing with some of those bigger uh bigger names, more mainstream more mainstream names, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Feel, it feels like it. it. Certainly feels like it to me. Like we're dealing with like you know just basic mainstream heretics. Mm-hmm. Like I got told coming out of the pulpit not terribly long ago that somebody remind that I reminded someone of Stephen Furtick and I didn't know if that was positive or negative or what was meant by it. Mm-hmm. And it turns out in God's kindness, what, what was meant was the thing that you said helped me understand what was bad about Stephen Furtick. And I listened to him for a long time, but you know, and I had no idea he was a heretic. Right. Right. And that he believed a bunch of wacko stuff. Right. But I didn't know. I had no idea, like, did he just mean that that was, like, engaging and exciting and and made him feel amped up somehow? Or did he mean, like, was he trying to compliment me? Like, I am I remind him in a positive way of that? Or mm-hmm. is it a, a negative, like, you reminded me of Stephen Furtick in a way and that's bad? Or, no, it just called to mind, oh, yeah, there's this guy, Stephen Furtick, that I thought was great and... The thing you said helped me put a placeholder around why he's bad. But anyhow, the, my point is like that's just like what 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 we're yeah mm-hmm. what we're dealing with, you know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, as we try to help and shepherd people into God's truth. Mm-hmm. And I think that there can be value too in analyzing and learning to recognize wickedness that comes in a more obvious 
variety because it trains your pattern recognition sense. So when the snake oil salesman that's actually going to be compelling to you comes along, you're like, okay, well, here's here are the three things that a snake oil salesman does. Like sometimes you Mm -hmm. need big, broad examples. I think that is part of the attraction, part of what's good about the attraction to monsters in cinema and monsters in literature. And, you know, the reason people enjoy our Phil episodes with Pastor Stu and things like that is because people want to be able to recognize predators in their own life. And that's not a bad thing. And Mm -hmm. so when you can kind of throw it into stark relief, when you can say, here's the Hannibal Lecter of, of, of whatever it is of Christendom. Yes. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Then it's like, okay, I, I know what somebody like this looks like broadly speaking. Now I just have to do the work of taking it down to my level. So, yeah. So I don't think it's always bad to protests are just helpful. It's why the bill is so helpful. It's why pastor Sue is so helpful. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think that the, when people, and so finding them in, in pop culture, that's or mainstream evangelical culture, it really is helpful. It, right. And it's something that I think in a, in a way has challenged our, if I can say it this way, I think it's challenged our egos mm-hmm. to have to go from saying it's beneath us to deal with Joel Osteen to actually, no, it's not. Yeah. You know, that, that's a good challenge to the, I, I think at least to my ego, it's beneath me to, to have to deal with Joel Osteen. No, it's not actually. Mm-hmm. And actually it's really helpful. And mm-hmm. when you, people can look down on, you know, some of the ways that we approach through our story podcasts, these sorts of things, but man, what wonderful placeholders that a pastor Stu or uh, an Erica Rosebloom mm-hmm. uh, can create in your mind. It It is what Charles Dickens can do. Mm-hmm. Oh, There's this a, guy's a Uriah Heap. I know what exactly, a Uriah Heap is. It, it's yeah, not that exactly everyone you meet is say. like rubbing their hands <laughs> uh-huh. together and like, well, sir, I, you know, but. No, but a Uriah Heap means something and is a placeholder that by virtue of being, and it allows you to the space for your, ego to deal with yourself, Mm -hmm. right? So if Pastor Stu is so far away from you that you can deal with your inner Pastor Stu without feeling like you're being attacked, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's actually kind of helpful. And and when you're right, Heap is so extreme. Or Ebenezer Scrooge. Or Ebenezer Scrooge, or any number of other sort of like Captain Ahab or whatever, right? Like just those like extreme grotesques, man, it allows you to safely deal with yourself or deal with people in a way that they can say, yeah, okay, I will. I'm not Erica Rosebloom, who is, Mm -hmm. but (laughs) I'm not Pastor Stu, who is, but Mm -hmm. I'm not Satan from Paradise Lost, but but, we mm -hmm. all know that we have the feeling of it's better to reign in hell than serve in heaven like that's Mm -hmm. that resonates with us for absolutely and and there's a reason why pastors have emailed me or or sent me messages saying you know i was in a coffee shop the other day and a pretty college student who goes to my church came in and said hi and sat down and i had pastor Stu in the back of my head and it boy did that help and protect me you know and give me the strength that I needed to get up and leave or say, it's really sweet to see you. I'm busy and working on something. And also I, I, I don't have one-on-one meetings with people from with, with the, with the opposite sex. Mm-hmm. Have a, have a good day, you know, or mm-hmm. whatever. Right. Like just that extra layer of protection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 we, we have a episode on Stephen King coming out on the bookening, which I think was a good discussion on the green mile and on Stephen King, the phenomenon and the man in general. But a thing that's always stuck with me from watching an interview with Stephen King is him talking about how, when he was a little kid, and I've said this on the podcast before, I know, but Charlie Starkweather was a spree, not a serial killer, but a spree killer, a, a guy that had a gun and just went and shot a bunch of people. And King read about him in the news when he was a little boy and he started obsessively cutting out pictures and things like that. And everybody just thought he was a freak. And his mom was, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you so dark, Stephen? And then he said, it wasn't because I was, I loved Starkweather. It was because I was really scared of him. And, and I suddenly realized that these people exist 
And if I run into one in the soda shop, if I see somebody walking down the street, I want to be able to recognize them and I want to walk the other way. I want to cross the street and or walk out of the soda shop. Like I, 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 I need that ability. Mm -hmm. yep. and yeah. Of course, that can turn into an obsession with dark things. Uh, and there, there's ways. And for many do. people, it does. And for many people, it Maybe does. Maybe Stephen King yeah. is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen King may or may not be one of them. <laughs> I'm not sure, but <laughs> who, who can say? <laughs> yeah, I think one, one thing that you're making 65 me... 65 books later. <laughs> yeah. 65. Or however five, many it is. $50 million, whatever it is. One, one thing you're, this conversation is making me think of is that we often think, well, we need to train our people to deal with the monsters who are very subtle. They're not so obvious. Oh, it's going to take a lot of... But what about the obvious monsters? <laughs> like, they're compelling. They're attractive. If you're just around them long enough, you do get kind of it, inured. Well, and here's, yeah. the, here's the thing that's actually true of each of us in this room. And I bet I can just say this and we'll all agree that it's true without maybe ever, having ever given it much thought. We came to our ability to deal with the subtle influences of more sophisticated bad teachers by way of having to deal with Joel Osteen and any number of other big. Mm -hmm. There was a time where we had to like look at a look at Joel Osteen and say, "Oh, this guy is bad," and now I know why. Yeah, I mean, I think generationally yeah. speaking, for us, it would be more Rob Bell, maybe. Yes. And there's, yeah, there's sure, any other sure, names, but, but but yes, points absolutely yeah. stand. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, Brian McClare and Rob Bell, any number of other sort of big obviously bad teachers to us now that may not have been at some point in time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Rob Bell was that guy in, in college for me. That was a great pull, but, you know, where it's just like he's seducing all kinds of my friends and my friends don't feel any tension between, you know, reading a Rob Bell book over here and reading a John Piper book over there. And why is that? And I don't like this guy and I can't quite put my finger on what's bad about him, but I know that he's bad. Mm -hmm. And now it's just like, well, uh, he's so obviously bad. He's so obviously mm -hmm. like who's got time to pick apart what's bad about Rob Bell. But that wasn't the case when I had been a believer for a year or two and his NUMA videos were being played in my Bible studies at, you know, Campus Crusade in college when I'm 19, 20 years old. Like, it's like, okay, like this feels bad. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on. Like, I'm just figuring this out. Well, it's also compelling, and the videos were very sexy in the way they were produced. Not sexual, but, you know, they were well-produced. They were also they, they sexual. Were and they were sexual. But, you know, it's not like he had I've bikini never seen models. One. But, uh, they're sensual. sensual. They're sensual in a way that he's just a in, in a in a very sort of, like, gay, effete kind of hmm. way. You know, but there's a sensuality to that man that's <laughs> obvious once you... Same with, what's his face, Billy Graham's nephew. Tavigian? Tully and Trevigian. Right? Right. Yeah, Granson, that's what mm -hmm. it is. Totally yeah, there's a, there's, there's a sensuality to that man that's just icky yeah. and gross. Mm -hmm. That yeah. yep, you know, yep. you know, you 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 wave a wand over it because he's a Christian and he's, he's a reformed a, Christian. He's a Christian mm. pastor, whatever it is, and you you refuse to see like the very obvious right thing, right? And I mean, that is what you know these guys do is they just sort of like wave their magic wands over everything and just sort of like the big lie, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, and people never account for how much the big lie will actually impact them personally and seduce them personally when it takes a real form in their real life. In other words, it's very easy to be discerning about Joel Osteen, but when your beloved cousin is Joel Osteen, when, you're, when you have an actual predator in your life and it's your cousin Bobby and you've known your cousin Bobby your whole life, it's really hard to say... Well, cousin Bobby can be that evil too. It's really hard to actually make those determinations when they hit close to home, and when there's a cost associated with them, when there's a relational cost, a financial cost. Mm -hmm. a, I'm going to turn down. So, so you can have a really obviously evil boss, but when he's offering you a really nice job with a really nice paycheck, it is he is not going to feel like an obviously evil boss to you. I mean, to take a a silly example, I guess, but not that silly. Well, Mr. there are all Potter. kinds of there yeah, are all kinds Potter. of things in our our brains that just trigger and trick us. Like the amount of social pressure, the amount of I mean, it, I was I was listening to somebody talk the other day about that that 
con- the concept of diffusion of responsibility, right? That that kind of classic example of somebody is being assaulted in an alley and a million people walk by and everybody averts their eyes. Kitty Genovese. And 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 so the idea is oh well because everyone's responsible nobody's responsible and aren't people terrible and don't people suck. And this is a this was a a psychologist picking that apart and showing that there've been any number of of actual tests that are done and what actually happens and what's actually happening psychologically to the crowd uh, in those moments is very different than that idea that people are callous and there's a diffusion of responsibility and people suck. Actually, what happens is people have a natural aversion to conflict. They they have a natural response to avoid it. They have a natural assumption between a man and a woman that there's a relationship and that it's a domestic affair and it's impolite to intrude. And it compounds naturally in a crowd because when you're facing uncertainty in a situation like that, that's extremely uncomfortable, you look for other people to cue off of. And everyone, because everyone cues the same way and then cues off of each other, it compounds and you can have horrible things that happen in broad daylight, but it's really easy to pop that bubble. Mm -hmm. And the instant the bubble is popped, the dominoes fall in the crowd turns. And so for instance, if you're a woman and you're being assaulted by a man, all you have to do, the thing that you have to remember and the thing that you have to do, and they've run experiments where they have done this, where they've had a man attacking a woman in broad daylight and in the exact same ways with the exact level of violence. And if she can simply communicate to the crowd, I don't know you or I don't know this man, that man goes from being able to do whatever he wants to being toast. Like if she can communicate, there's not a relationship and that she actually needs help. Suddenly men act and step in, in, into, into action. And that's an important thing. If you're a woman listening to this, to just remember you're in that situation. If you communicate, I don't know you. If you find one person in the crowd, you with the blue jacket, help me. I don't know this man. And he turns the crowd will come to your aid, mm-hmm. by and large. And the point of sorry, Ben, you're gonna. Well, I, I just <clears throat> you're just reminding me of the Old Testament laws on rape. You know, if a woman if a woman is is raped but she doesn't cry out, she's basically just guilty of adultery. Right. You know, if she claims like, oh, I was raped. Well, you didn't say it. You, like, but but once she cries out, anyway. Yeah. Well, here's the thing: she can yell for she can yell help, right? And that may not turn the crowd. Right. She has to establish that it's serious. Mm-hmm. She has to remove doubt. And the easiest way to remove doubt is to signal there's no relationship, prior relationship here. Right. Right. And I, and I would assume, I guess what you're making me think is I assume that's what the content of the cry would be, or that seems obvious now that you're saying it. Yeah. I don't know you. I don't know this man. Somebody help. Right. 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 Which um, I think actually makes a tremendous amount of sense. Like I have sympathy for the people in the crowd. And the reason is, nine times out of ten, you don't want to be the person that yells fire in a crowded theater. You don't, you don't actually want to be get something like that wrong. Yeah. You there. There are many, many domestic disputes that aren't ultimately violent that you don't ultimately want to insert yourself into. There are lots of situations in life where it would be better for you to keep your mouth shut. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the things that works in the favor of real predators in real life, because you don't just want to be the person that cries child molester without evidence or Mm -hmm. that. Right. And so then you have these people and what you end up having is this sort of like compounding social proof. Right. Right. Like the more popular they get, the more popular they're destined to become because Everybody is sort of going along with the crowd and swimming upstream, and nobody is really able or willing to step in at the critical moment and stop this guy in in his tracks. Or and and now you have this sort of like massive critical mass, and then, then the bigger it gets, the bigger it gets. And so it's just like, well, nobody wants to like. How do you how do you stop something like this where? It's such a self-validating sort of circle. Mm-hmm. And this is how people BS their way to fame anyway, right? This is how, if I can just pretend, if I can lie, 
if I can lie about and make it look and have the appearance of of popularity, then then gullible people will want to be associated with the thing that's popular. And then th- that'll actually create a wave of gullible people that create creates a bigger wave. It's like, just a ripple effect. That's what Oakley did, I read. <clears throat> he just created advertisements that said, this awesome brand, this awesome brand, and Oakley. <clears throat> and people started the, being interested the sunglasses. in Oakley. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, in a lot of a lot of companies, uh, if they get enough venture capital, mm-hmm. they can just do that. Mm-hmm. If they can get like, and this is why like, a, you know, a brand can be started by a an influencer or by an athlete or something like that. You just get the right person that you want to be associated with, LeBron James or whoever. It doesn't matter actually how good your product is. People want to be associated with LeBron James. You'll get the money. You'll get the influence. And then you'll get the ability to actually turn around and create the, a decent product. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean that, like, you know, there is a sense in which uh, it, this this whole episode is really ultimately about that, right? That sense of social pr- – there's a sense in which we've contributed to the – to the problem or to we did an episode on Joel Osteen. It's called Joel Osteen. Mm-hmm. And it is just one more thing out there that bears his name. Right. And at this point he's so big that negative criticism can't do him much harm and may in some ways only do him good. Um, but we're talking about here. What the fact that we talked about this at episode right now means more people are going to go back and they're going to listen to that episode. Mm-hmm. They're going to go back. They're going to listen to us talking about it and be like, man, what did they say about jealousy? Oh, the most popular. Let's go back. Let's figure out like, what did they have to let? It's going to compound. Right. right? And there's virtue in that social proof in and of itself can actually be one of the best and most honest ways to market. Right. You don't say like this thing. It's really great. You say, this is the thing that we do that everybody seems to like the most. Mm -hmm. And then it, and then it sells more. Because people are like, oh, well, I didn't know where to start with Sound of Sanity, but they said that this was their most popular episode, so I guess I'll I'll start there. It's like when you go to a restaurant and they have on the menu most popular mm-hmm. or bestseller or something like that, right. and it's your first time there. Well, you don't know. It's a big menu. and Or you ask to simply ask the waiter, waiter or waitress, like, what's your most popular? What's your best-selling thing? And they tell you, and it's like, okay, well, that's the thing that's going to sell now. And it's that's actually... That has integrity, actually, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that has real integrity. It's just honesty. It's like, well, I don't know. This is what people say. This is what people are doing. The guy talked about in this little thing I was listening to about how uh, Toyota, a Toyota dealer, I think it was a Toyota dealership. I could be wrong about this. I think it was a Toyota dealership ran an ad for more salespeople. And they were running an ad because they were selling a lot of cars and they didn't have enough salespeople to keep up with demand. So they actually ran an ad for, we can't keep up with demand. We need more salespeople. There's great opportunities here. Come work for this Toyota dealership. And what happened? Like demand skyrocketed, demand skyrocketed. And it was an unintended consequence of simply saying, man, our cars are so popular. We need more salespeople. (laughs) Right. And so people are like, Oh, these cars are really popular. I guess that's the car I want. That's pretty cool. The the real the, there's there's for me personally a bad moral to this episode and one that I will not act upon. But the moral of the story is you're making me want to watch Mad Men again. <laughs> yeah, but that show is full of fornication, so I won't. But all the advertising scenes in that show are a lot of fun. Uh, okay, well, Joel Listing's a jerk, but nine out of ten doctors say that you should support patreon.com forward slash sound of sanity it's good for you and less irritating for your throat everyone is doing it what more social proof than that can you need go to patreon.com forward slash sound of sanity you can be part of our discord you can talk to us about things you can be like ah that second joel osteen episode that was a staggering achievement for humanity in general and we'll be like thank you Thank you. Are you going to up your support? And you'll be like, no, but I thought it was good. We can have those kinds of conversations. What else can you do on Patreon, Ben? If you can watch cool, I don't know, you can give even more money. Yeah, you can That's give, what you can do. Yeah. That's the main thing that you can do. <laughs> Man, Every, everyone likes to do that. 20,679 physicians say patreon.com forward slash 
Sound of Sanity. It relieves is, heartburn. It relieves heartburn. So go there. And anything else we want to advertise or prove so, socially? Prove socially? <laughs> no. Yeah. I think we just want to be done. Until next time. Stay sane. No! I guess the episode's starting again, guys. I hit the wrong button. All right. So, uh, all right. Sound of sanity. Double it up, Stay baby. Stay sane. <laughs> Yeah. Hey everybody, welcome to Sound of Sanity. My name is Nathan. I am your humble and obedient host. We've got Ben, the pastor who's a preacher of righteousness right there. And Ben, why don't you introduce hey. the third guy? That's Jake. He's hey, the pastor who's the master of sanity. That's me. Guys, the most popular episode we've <laughs> ever done, Joel Osteen. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I got a theory, Nathan. Let's hear it. My theory is it's popular because it's popular. All right. Thanks for listening. Time is a flat circle. Time is a flat circle. Everything just keeps repeating. If Matthew McConaughey has taught us nothing else, it's that flat is a time. Time is a flat circle is actually a Nietzschean. It's it's the summary of the Nietzschean doctrine of eternal recurrence. Mm. Cool. Now you know. I know that. Matthew McConaughey. Did you know that? Also, I mean, it's it's a very famous internet meme though through what's that the true blood season one or true detective or yeah i don't think you knew that i don't think you knew anything about nietzsche or existentialist philosophy whatsoever nathan jake's right i don't even know what the word existentialism means well but you did know that matthew mcconaughey taught us to make a sailboat windsurfing thingy in the desert to escape bad guys so i knew that that might come in handy i knew that much yeah I feel like this is all. I feel like this episode is eternally re- reoccurring. <laughs> Let's keep it going. So, are we going to talk about Christopher Nolan or what then? Does he. Guys. Let's give up. You want to give up? <laughs> yeah. On life? Just say goodbye. No, yeah. just, just on this episode. Oh, just on this life, episode. Life is great. That's much better. Okay, yeah. yeah. Life, I life is awesome. Thought you were. Right, let's go live it. Saying, <laughs> let's go have some. Take a loaded gun and uh, go, go shoot some stuff. Yeah. Can, some cans. Life. No. Time is a flat circle, and this episode is a loaded gun. Yep. Happiness. Sail- Happiness is a warm gun. It's a warm gun. Sailing through yeah. the desert with Penelope Cruz. <laughs> Gently rocking. <laughs> Gently rocking. Hey, you're welcome, listener. We saved all the nonsense until the end. We never do that. We always front load it, but we back load it at this time. So you're welcome if you hate nonsense. But if you like nonsense, then I'm sorry we made you wait for it for so long. Hmm. But isn't it the the weight, the thing that makes it sweet? So much sweet. So much sweet. Sweets to the sweet. (sighs) All right. Until, no, go to patreon.com forward slash sound of sanity. What you really want to do is join our Discord, which has now tens of participants. Yes, it does. Tens. Multiple tens of, of participants. You want to be a part of the crowd and you want to be in early before it gets out of control so that you can say you were there at the beginning before tens become hundreds become thousands and yep. years become millennia and what was once known is lost and to the dust of time to the dust of time yep and then you discover there's no reason joel osteen's popular because he's joel osteen mm-hmm. and he's popular because he's popular we're talking about it we're contributing to it we are the problem and it will all repeat